Hello, everybody. I'm Zainab Badawi, and a big warm welcome to you all to the Curtain Raiser event for the 56th annual meeting of the Board of Governors of the Asian Development Bank that will be held next week from the 2nd to the 5th of May in Incheon, the Republic of Korea. And this is the third year of a conversation with President Masatsugu Asakawa, which is steadily becoming a highlight in our calendar. Well, today we're going to be focusing on rebounding Asia and the Pacific, forging the path forward. Hello, President Massa, lovely to see you just days before the annual meeting. And once again, thanks to technology, it seems that we're in one location in the ADB's library, but actually you are in Manila and I'm in London. Tell me, how have you been and how are things at the ADB? Hi, how have you been? Well, uh, one of these days, uh, there are a couple of things uh, which makes me feel happy. First of all, I am now able to go on a mission without any restriction. So last year, I visited uh, Indonesia for a couple of times because of, of its G20 presidency. And also, uh, I visited uh, Uzbekistan, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, South Korea, Cambodia, and a couple of non-regional countries in Europe and the US. Uh, this year, I have been to already India and Bangladesh uh, to see prime ministers, finance ministers, to talk to them directly, which is completely different uh, from talk to them via screen. Mm. Uh, second of all, I am very happy uh, that we finally uh, reopened our headquarters here in Manila in September last year. And I asked every staff to come back. So nowadays, uh, during the lunchtime, the cafeteria is very much crowded and I, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> And Good. Also, well, I hope you managed to get something to eat with all those <laughs> long queues. <laughs> right. Mm. And also, I asked the staff uh, to come back to Manila. And after they come back to Manila, I, I allowed the staff to work from home on average two days per week. And I, I hope that this kind of flexible uh, new way of working uh, would contribute to the improvement of staff's uh, efficiency, job e efficiency. And thirdly, as you rightly mentioned, uh, this year, uh, South Korea is kind enough to host uh, our annual meeting here, uh, there in, in Chon, uh, in person. And in-person annual meetings uh, is taking place for the first time during the last three years. So I'm very much excited to see, you know, many, many governors, automated governors, to talk about uh, uh, ADB operations and also the uh, challenges they are facing. Well, it's wonderful to open this conversation on such a happy, upbeat <laughs> note and to hear about everything that you're doing, all your globe trotting and people coming back to headquarters in Manila. And that makes me think that actually we are generally in the Asia and Pacific region beginning to see that life has gone back to normal pretty much and that, you know, COVID is very much behind us um, for good, we, we hope. So then give us an overview, President Massa, of how you see the economic situation in the region. Yeah, the economic growth of so-called developing Asia in 2022, last year, was 4.2 percent, down from 72 percent in 2021. And this year, in 2023, ADP predicts it around 4.8%. So it went down from two years ago, but compared with other uh, part of the world, uh, uh, the economic growth rate is relatively high and the inflation rate is contained relatively low. So I would say developing Asia has been growing in a very robust and steady pace. Although we have to bear in mind a couple of risks involved. Well, what are those risks then, President Massa? First of all, you know, the economic prospect of uh, ad advanced countries like US and Europe. As you know, Fed and the ECB has, have raised uh, their policy interest rate a couple of times to uh, 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 quell inflationary pressures. And quite recently, uh, one of these days, the US Fed already started to slow down the pace of interest rate hike. But uh, it's not clear yet uh, whether uh, you know, those advanced economies will end up successfully with so-called soft landing scenario or you know, falling into a recession uh, due to the persistent inf inflationary pressure in the uh, service sector and so on. And also this rapid uh, pace of interest rate hike has really tightened uh, global financial conditions. From uh, last year, uh, both short-term and long-term uh, yield uh, has have uh, raised, risen, premium has increased, and quite recently we saw signs of strains in the banking sector both in US and Europe. 
Uh, as a result, uh, the central banks in our region also uh, started to raise its policy uh, rate, which would strain uh, the growth momentum uh, of each country. You're absolutely right. I mean, you know, um, from my position here in London, I can see that there's so much turmoil in the financial markets, as you say, the stress on some banks and uh, economies, inflationary pressures and interest rate hikes and so on. And, and of course, it has a ripple effect um, on your region. And also uh, another big impact um, on your region has been, of course, what's been happening in Ukraine. February was a year since the Russian invasion um, of Ukraine. So, and the impact has been felt throughout the world, of course. But just give us an idea of how it's affected the Asia Pacific region. Well, uh, talking of Russian invasion of Ukraine, initially we worried about uh, its negative impact on uh, some countries in Central Asia. Caucasus and Mongolia, uh, who maintains uh, very close uh, trade and economic ties with the uh, Russian Federation. But so far, their economies has uh, proved to be very resilient. They are doing okay. On the other hand, uh, the steep increase in energy price and food price, exacerbated by Russian invasion of Ukraine, has really aggravated balance of payment of a couple of vulnerable countries like Pakistan, like Sri Lanka. So we are close, closely monitoring and uh, uh, maintain close communication, especially with uh, IMF and World Bank, as uh, to uh, the most updated uh, economic and financial situation. Uh, more in general, we are very much concerned about food security issue. Uh, the data says uh, that uh, uh, in our region, 425 million people were affected by hunger. Even in 2021, one year before, one year before our Russian invasion of Ukraine, so uh, we need to address hunger issue, especially for poor and vulnerable urgently, while uh, developing long-term solution to improve uh, food security issue. To that end, the ADB announced a $14 billion financial package that was in September last year, uh, which uh, include both uh, short-term measures and long-term measures. Uh, short-term measures include very quick uh, dispersing budget financing, through, uh, we call it the CSF, a counter-cyclical support facility, uh, to support our DMCs, developing member countries, to provide food and necessities urgently for vulnerable and poor. And long-term uh, measure, measures include uh, investment in agriculture sector to make agriculture system in our DMC more robust and resilient through climate smart agriculture, nature-based solution, and the further utilization of digital technology in food supply chains. So important, isn't it, that you're pursuing those two things in tandem, the immediate help, the budget for your support now, as well as maintaining that long-term vision in ensuring that you can actually achieve food security in the long term. Very important. I, I want to look um, at China for a moment, please, President Massa, because, of course, it's the biggest economy in the region. And uh, what happens in the Chinese economy, of course, has a ripple effect um, throughout the entire Asia-Pacific region. So just tell us how you see the Chinese economy affecting the economic outlook. Mm. Yeah, China, Chinese economy declined sharply from 8.4% in uh, 2021 to just 3% in 2022, uh, mainly due to the very stringent zero corona policy and also some challenges they are facing in the uh, property sector. Uh, but now they have exited from uh, a zero corona policy. So this year, 2023, we expect the Chinese economy will recover. Uh, ADB uh, uh, predict 5.0% growth rate uh, for China this year. This is good news for commodity exporting countries to China and also for the countries uh, who have uh, uh, close ties uh, with the Ch Chinese economy in terms of supply chain network and also tourism. One thing we have to bear in mind is uh, this is a uh, rather upside risk. But if and when the Chinese economy will end up with uh, even stronger uh, growth rate than we are currently predicting, uh, that might add uh, you know, additional inflationary pressure on crude oil price and other commodity price and so on. So that's an upside risk we have to bear in mind. Yeah, a little bit of a worry there, of course, already putting pressure on energy prices, which already have um, had a, a lot of pressure put on them. Um, 
You know, President Massa, you at the Asian Development Bank, along with all multilateral development banks, or MDBs for short, are coming under increasing pressure, really, by their members to uh, contribute much more to public global goods such as climate and health. And they're urging change and reform. So what are you doing at the Asian Development Bank to change and reform to meet these challenges? Yes, uh, I clearly recognize that MDBs, including ADBs, are strongly expected uh, to play a more active role uh, to take care of uh, global public goods, like climate change issue, global health issue, and so on. The one thing I'd like to stress uh, is that uh, you know, our short-term crisis uh, uh, response, uh, like COVID-19 pandemic, like a food uh, uh, crisis, and long-term investment agenda, like uh, climate change, poverty alleviation, agenda, quality infrastructure, and so on, they are not mutually exclusive. Uh, we may have to do uh, both things at the you know, same time, whenever necessary. Climate change is a good example. You know, when our global economy recovered from the COVID-19 pandemic, it was inevitable uh, that uh, global greenhouse gas emission also increased. So let's start with uh, climate change issue. It's a really uncomfortable truth uh, that this region, Asian Pacific region, is one of the most vulnerable uh, region against natural disaster. Uh, we saw what happened in Pakistan and also Bangladesh last year and so on. Uh, so I always say our fight against uh, climate change would be won or lost in, in this region. As I mentioned last year, ADB already elevated our ambition uh, from $80 billion to $100 billion of cumulative climate financing for 12 years, from 2019 to 2030. So 12 years, $100 billion for 12 years means, uh, you know, on average, $8.3 billion per year, on average. And our actual climate financing uh, in 2021 was 3.5 billion uh, dollars, which is well below our target, uh, mainly due to the pandemic. But uh, 2022, last year, it increased to 6.7 billion dollars, and I'm quite sure this year we will exceed 7.0, and we will do our best uh, to you know, meet our you know, ambition of 100 billion uh, cumulatively uh, by 2030. Also, I'd like to uh, emphasize uh, that uh, we aim at uh, investing at least one third of this 100 ambition, which means uh, 34 billion dollars in adaptation as well. And at the same time, as I mentioned uh, of previous year, uh, last year as well, we decided to withdraw our financing from uh, uh, new coal-fired power plants. But uh, still the issue remains, uh, that is, uh, in our region, there are so many coal-fired coal -fired power plants already existing and operating, and they are relatively young. Uh, so we have been working on uh, one very innovative financial instrument called ETM, Energy Transition Mechanism, to let those existing coal-fired power plants retire early, earlier than originally scheduled, by utilizing so-called blended financing, which is a low-cost financing. And I'm very happy to uh, you know, tell you, at the margin of G20 a summit meeting in Bali, uh, in uh, November last year, we could sign an MOU to specify one concrete coal power plant in Indonesia called the Chiremo 1 uh, in West Java, 660 megawatts, to be retired early under this ETM uh, mechanism as a first example. And uh, I'd like to expand this application of ETM to other projects in Indonesia and also in other countries of the, of the region as quickly as possible. I remember the ETM. You announced it at COP26, didn't you, to support right. green growth and um, energy transition. So lovely to hear about the progress you're making on that. But y you've also got some uh, other initiatives or instruments that you need in your toolkit to scale up that climate action as well as your other development goals. So what are those? Yeah, we are also, MDBs are also un, uh, strongly encouraged to invest more and more in climate change arena, right? And uh, that's why we elevated our ambition to 100 billion. Uh, but also we have been working on another type of innovative financial instrument called IFCAP. IFCAP, IFCAP, stands for Innovative Financing Facility for Climate in Asia and Pacific, IFCAP, which is an instrument 
to increase ADB's uh, climate financing by utilizing a uh, guaranteed mechanism, which simply means whenever uh, any uh, borrowing country fails to repay its debt to ADB, the donor countries, as a guarantor, will pay to ADB on its behalf. So from ADB's point of view, we have no risk at all. And the beauty of this mechanism is that whenever one dollar of ADB's climate financing is guaranteed by any donors, we can expand uh, not only one dollar, but five dollars, for example, of climate financing. So leverage ratio is five to uh, one to five in this case, for example. And furthermore, wh when we provide additional five dollar climate financing, then we expect, I expect, uh, that further financing will come in from other MDBs, other bilateral donors, and other uh, private sector financial institutions in the form of co-financing, parallel financing, and so on. That would be great. So we are aiming at launching this IFCAP mechanism at this annual meeting in Incheon uh, this year. Wonderful. So IFCAP, you heard it here, the Innovative <laughs> Finance Facility for Climate in Asia and the Pacific, IFCAP. Yes. It's, uh, yeah, it rolls off the tongue. Well, I look forward to the launch. Now, you know, President Massa, MDBs are again being urged to lend and give more to um, the developing world. And I know you've talked about the assistance you've given, a great deal of it, um, for COVID um, relief. And I know that multilateral development banks have CAF, C-A-F, which is the Capital Adqu Adequacy Framework, which kind of gives you guidelines about how much risk you can take on in trying to pursue your development goals and how much you can lend to um, developing countries. So what are you doing at the ADB mm to really try to expand your lending capacity to those DMCs, because that's just so important. Yes, thank you. Yeah, we are also currently updating our CAF, uh, Capital Adequacy Framework, this year, uh, in order to uh, uh, expand our lending capacity uh, by uh, optimizing our balance sheet. And at the same time, we are carefully reviewing the recommendation made by G20 independent panel. Uh, it may be at, at a bit too early to draw a firm conclusion at this stage, but I am of a strong uh, impression that ADB uh, uh, shareholders uh, do not wish uh, to change overall risk appetite of ADB uh, this time. So I expe expect that the new CAF uh, coming out of this uh, year's review uh, will continuously protect a uh, AAA rating of ADB to ensure that the investment confidence be maintained and also to ensure ADB has uh, sufficient capital to continuously lend even at a time of crisis without relying on so-called corrupt capitals. That said, uh, I'd, I'd like to tell you that uh, we are taking this opportunity to, to update uh, our CAF to comprehensively uh, review uh, the other options, further options to optimize our uh, balance sheet. And actually, we have done already a couple of measures to that end. For example, uh, we uh, concluded two, already two, so-called exchange exposure agreement with uh, Inter-American Development Bank to reduce our you know, country concentration risk twice already, uh, once in 2020 and the second time in 2022, with a total amount of $2.5 billion. Also, quite recently, we introduced the so-called $1 billion master insurance uh, framework as to our non-sovereign uh, operations uh, with uh, five global reading insurers to risk transfers. Also, as I, I mentioned, uh, I'm very proud. ADB has shown such a great appetite for innovative financial uh, instruments like IFCAP, <laughs> which would uh, increase our uh, investment uh, financing by utilizing guarantee mechanism. Fascinating. I mean, the DMCs really do need um, all those kind of instruments and innovative ideas um, that you are talking about. Now, I, I also understand that the ADB has um, developed a new operating model, which is um, going to be implemented this year. So just set out for us what it is and how you think it's going to enhance your work. And how far um, is this part of the ADB's evolving process, its evolution. Yes, thank you, Zainab. Yes, uh, for the last three years, I would say, we have gone through various uh, uh, reform initiatives 
uh, like CTI, Cultural Transformation Initiative, came up, a knowledge management action plan, resident mission review, technical assessment review, and so on. So I think it's about time for ADB to uh, go through necessary structure change to support those initiatives. Actually, the current structure, st organizational structure of ADB was introduced in 2002, uh, 20 years ago. So I'm quite sure there are so many areas to be upgraded, to be fixed. The uh, ADB would be able to uh, you know, better accommodate the ever-changing needs of our clients and also to implement our strategy 2030 more efficiently and effectively. For example, we uh, declared uh, to be a climate bank uh, for Asia and the Pacific. We mean it. Then uh, we would like to see some necessary organizational change which support that ambition. We also uh, keep on saying that you know, it's our strength to provide both uh, sovereign uh, lending and non-sovereign lending on the same balance sheet. That's true. But I'd like to see some necessary organizational restructuring would further integrate those two operations more closely. One thing we should be careful is that organizational restructuring of this magnitude do not happen so often. So implementation, it cannot be implemented in one day. Actually, the full implementation might take a couple of years, and we should be extremely careful uh, not to disrupt ongoing ADB operations as much as possible. But nonetheless, I am really uh, you know, excited uh, to embark on a new journey of ADB and a new operating model in a couple of weeks. Yeah, I think that um, sums it up, really. So it really will help you implement your strategies so much more. So we look forward to seeing how um, that's all going to um, progress this year. Now, President Massa, I can't have a conversation with you without mentioning domestic resource mobilization. I know one of your long-term passions and you've real expertise um, in this area. We've talked about it before. You've talked about how you can strengthen it through international tax cooperation in the past and so on. But I just wonder if you could give us some thoughts on domestic resource mobilization this year uh, in the current context that we've been discussing. Yeah, thank you, Zainab, uh, for that question. The government in our region has been facing quite un unexpected uh, accumulation of public debt and shrinking tax revenues. COVID-19 pandemic exposed uh, the strong need for substantial investment in uh, health sector, education sector, and social uh, protection program. So we definitely need more predictable and stable uh, revenue flows. And those de revenue flows should come from domestic resource mobilization, from tax revenue rather than relying on too, too much on external financing. If you look at the uh, tax to GDP ratio in this region, the ratio is relatively low, lower than other parts of the world. Sometimes uh, some countries are below 15% 15 15 threshold, which is generally recognized as a minimum level to achieve sustainable uh, development. So definitely uh, there should be some room to improve tax policy, raise more tax revenue, and also there should be some room uh, to improve tax correction function uh, more efficiently and effectively. Uh, one more thing I'd like to address, uh, ad I'd like to stress, is that uh, the importance of ITC. ITC means international tax corporations. And that this globalized world uh, where uh, cross-border transactions is inevitable, I think country, countries should really meet uh, international tax standard to avoid non-double taxation. Non-double taxation simply means tax is not paid anywhere in the world. That should be avoided. And uh, for example, BEPS is a good example. A so-called two-pillar solution uh, agreed among almost 140 uh, countries in October 2021 was epoch-making. Especially pillar one uh, should be beneficial for developing and emerging economies in uh, our region, in Asia and the Pacific region because Pillar 1 would enable market economies, market countries, to impose fair amount of corporate taxation on foreign large multinational enterprises, doing business in that country and making profit in that country, even without any physical presence. You know, traditionally, international taxation rule said you can uh, impose a corporate tax on foreign companies only if that foreign companies have some kind of physical presence. We call it PE, permanent establishment, in your country. 
But uh, nowadays, big uh, multinational enterprises can make profit even without any PE by utilizing digital technology, by utilizing e-commerce, and so on. So I believe that uh, Asian countries uh, will continuously host many, many multinational enterprises uh, from now on. So countries should really take advantage of this historical agreement as much as possible. But regrettably, 26 uh, DMCs, developing member countries of ADB, do not uh, join in our BEPS agreement. So through the regional tax hub uh, we established in 2021, I'd like to further promote the tax policy discussion to raise more tax revenue and the discussion on how to uh, make our tax uh, administration more effective and efficient and encourage our DMCs to participate in BEPS agreement. Yeah, you keep on mentioning the BEPS agreement, of course, just to help people with their acronyms here. Of course, it stands for Base Erosion Profit Shifting. Yes. And um, yeah, just to uh, remind everybody, um, fascinating. And, and you're right to emphasize the fact that you need that kind of domestic resource mobilization at national level, where you increase your um, ratio of, of tax to GDP so that you can meet all those sustainable development goals, as well as you say, the kind of international tax cooperation that you've been talking about there. And, you know, we also spoke last year about the importance of resilient and connected economies and also we talked about the future of globalization and you expressed a lot of optimism there that globalization is going to flourish and isn't at all dead and you know reports of its death are, are greatly exaggerated so what are your thoughts about it this year are you still optimistic <laughs> yeah Let's, let's focus on you know, uh, the future of a uh, global supply chain network, which is a good example of globalization. As you know, uh, Zainab, uh, global and regional supply chain network has been a, a driving force for the very strong economic growth in this region for the last two decades. Firms and uh, countries uh, evolved throughout the production process, forming uh, what is sometimes referred to as factory Asia. As a result, the regional trade boomed and uh, uh, the economic growth rate uh, was uh, 6% per, per year on average before pandemic. And also the number of people living below the absolute po poverty level, which is defined as $2.15 cents per day, dramatically re reduced by 80% uh, from 1.3 trillion people in 1999 to 187 million people in uh, 2019. Amid that progress, uh, global and the regional supply chain faced several challenges. First, the uh, global trade, regional trade, really slowed down right after the uh, global financial crisis some um, 15 years ago. And second, trade once again stagnated for the last three years, initially uh, due to a uh, trade tension and then uh, due to uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But despite of those challenges, I do think uh, that our regional, regional supply chain, especially in this uh, Asian region, has proven to be very strong resilient. Uh, and uh, I think uh, strong resiliency of our regional uh, supply chain in this region is one of the reasons why inflation rate, rate is relatively low compared with other parts of the world. I also please be reminded that the uh, regional supply chain was a key to the production of vaccines, PPEs, and other medical supplies during the uh, COVID-19 period. And it should be also noted that the value added uh, created uh, by a supply chain is incre in increasingly generated outside of traditional uh, manufacturing areas in such areas as intellectual property and services. So looking ahead, as globalization comes back and as our global trading systems moves to uh, new normal, I do believe that the uh, global and regional supply chain network will once again play a key role in the process of recovery from pandemic and other crises. So strategy uh, should be to reinvigorate our uh, open and uh, free trade systems. Also strategy should be built on the clear understanding where the value, value added is created by incorporating a new type of uh, supply chain linked to uh, intellectual property, service and innovations. And I do believe that this type of new value, uh, supply chain uh, will provide a new opportunity to take part in the global, uh, global trading system, especially for low-income countries, uh, small to medium-sized enterprises, and poor and vulnerable.
Fascinating. Always true. You can always turn challenges into opportunities, can't you, President Massa? <laughs> so finally, President Massa, I must ask you, you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that now that COVID travel restrictions have been lifted, you can really travel so much more. I wonder if you could just pick one highlight of your travels for us. Yes. Uh, last year, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Cambodia where I had the opportunity to visit uh, one senior high school uh, outside Phnom Penh, to which uh, we, ADB provided some financing for their STEM program. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. And I was uh, glad uh, to meet many uh, teachers and students involved in that uh, program. And I'm extremely uh, happy to see that they are focusing on education on girls and uh, training of uh, female teachers. I had a brief chat with one a girl student whose name was Monica. Monica told me what kind of subject she'd like to study more under this program. And also she told me future career plan that she'd like to pursue after graduation. Big smile wholeheartedly. So I strongly felt that I saw the bright future of Cambodia in her shining face and in her shining eyes. And they affirmed my firm belief that investment in human beings is the most crucial things to do to achieve inclusive and sustainable development. Thank you. That's um, absolutely a very moving account there. I, I love the story of Monica in Cambodia, whom you met there. And it reminds me, actually, of what the late former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan once said, and he said, to educate girls is to reduce poverty. President Massa, as always, it's been a pleasure to talk with you and to listen to your insights and experiences. And I'm sure the annual meeting in the Republic of Korea will be an all-round success, and I look forward to seeing you there. Till then, keep well and don't work too hard, though I know you won't listen to me and you'll be working round the clock as usual. Thank you so much for uh, talking to me and thank you to everybody else who's uh, been watching this conversation. From me, Zainab Badawi, goodbye. Thank you, Zainab. See you in the